Hey there, Magic players. Barry White here from Magic Untapped. You know, we all have our favorite Magic the Gathering sets. I, myself, well, Fallen Empire seems to be one of my favorites. It was my first new release, and as they say, you never forget your first. But favorite sets don't only have to be for the players. It can also be for the people behind the game. I sit down, I'm talking with Mark Rosewater to talk about what some of his favorite and most cherished Magic the Gathering sets are. All right, Mark, so you, you've designed, you're coming up on 50 sets you've, you've led. What are the ones that are just the most important to you? The ones that, are that for you are the ones you cherish the most? Wow, this is like, of your children, which one do you love the most? Uh, and the answer is, I, one of the reasons I've been doing this job forever, I mean, this, uh, last year was my 25th year making magic cards. And so the reason I keep doing this, the reason that I love it, it's my dream job, is I really, really enjoy making magic. Um, so every set, there's something about every set that I truly do love. Um, are there ones that, you know, uh, stand out a little bit? Um, I don't, I'm not saying I love them more or anything, just when the ones that stand out. Uh, let, let me name a few. Um, Tempest was the first set I ever did. Um, I was actually hired as a developer, not as a designer. Uh, and so that was me proving that I could design um, and really got me on the track of, of being a magic designer. Um, so that will always have a warm place in my heart as being sort of where I got my start. I, I'm very proud of it. I think Tempest definitely did a lot of things that sort of shifted where magic was and, and, and raised the bar of sort of how we made magic sets. So I'm very, very proud of Tempest. Um, next up, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go roughly chronologically here, I guess. Um, Unglued was, uh, I think, the third set I ever designed. Basically, someone came to me, uh, you know, Bill, Bill Rose uh, and, um, and Joel Mick, and said, we have a weird idea for a set. All we know is it's not legal in tournaments. Do with that as you will. Uh, and I really tapped into my comedy writing. I tapped into, you know, just the part of me that really wants to push boundaries. And, I mean, unglued in all the unsets that followed it, um, really are my love of, of both comedy and of, I really, magic to me is so many different things. And we do a lot to reinforce sort of the competitive side of the game. But I love that the unsets are kind of the, the cheerleader of the most casual side of magic. That, you know, that sometimes you play magic to have fun and to laugh and to enjoy just being with your friends. And that the act of playing can be as enjoyable as whether you win or not. And the unsets are just that embodied in, you know, in, in sets. Uh, and so Unglued really was, I'm, I'm super proud. I mean, I'm, I'm proud of all the unsets, uh, but Unglued was the thing that sort of introduced that concept. And then I, I feel like I keep improving upon it, but, um, you know, Unglued was the thing that introduced that for the first time. Ravnica, obviously, is probably the most influential set that I've led. Um, you know, it, it very much changed the shape of sort of how we made magic. It really put factioning on, on, the, on the sort of the front burner. I mean, we, we just do faction sets all the time now. Uh, it introduced hybrid mana. It, 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 and it really reshaped how we thought about how we did drafting, how we made blocks, how we did all sorts of things. And so, uh, I mean, Ravna, and, and like I said, it really, it, it's just a set that sort of has gone on to be such a beloved set. And I, I obviously have a lot of really strong feelings about that. Um, Innistrad, I think, uh, is almost as influential as Ravnica is as far as what came after it. Um, Innistrad, they just put the flag in the ground of kind of how to do a top-down set. I mean, we'd experimented with that before, but it really was sort of like the modern way we make top-down sets was, it, it, it was sort of the, the, the precedent that really sort of said, here's how to do it. And it might be the, I mean, with, with help from my uh, lead designer, Eric Lauer, it might be just the best set that I've been involved with ever come out. I mean, it's just, it, it's so solid. Um, and the other big thing that I did in, in Innistrad uh, uh, that, I, that I love so much is really figuring out how to make gameplay have resonance in the gameplay. Like how the, the zombies felt like zombies. They didn't just look like zombies and were named like zombies, but they literally played like how zombies in the movies you would see a zombie. And that, that idea really sort of changed the nature of how things happen. Like um, schnozberries taste like schnozberries. Yes. <laughs> um, Zendikar is another set where um, I really try to introduce something. And um, the, the, the irony behind the scenes is 
how every everybody kept pushing back the set. Like it took like seven years to get Zendikar made um, because it no one quite understood what it was. Uh, and the idea of we're just going to find this interesting space, like lands matter. Like it's just a weird thing. Um, but it really was something where we made something so beautiful out of it. And, and I really like what Zendikar became and the world of Zendikar. And it, it just was a cool jumping off point. And it really taught me the lesson of let players do the thing they want to do. Like before that, there's a lot of this idea of we need to create tension. Like we need to make players, do I want to do thing A or thing B? And like Zendikar taught us a lesson of how about we just let them do thing A and reward them for it. And they want to do thing A anyway. And, you know, that it really sort of rethought a little bit about how we made magic sets. Throne of Eldraine. Uh, Throne of Eldraine, uh, sometimes you have an idea. Uh, and it's very, very funny how... Um, it's weird how like I had this in my head. It was very well thought out what I wanted, and it I, I it wasn't something I could make until I found a way to connect it to something else. And um, I'm a big fan of resonance. I'm a big fan of sort of um, letting sets be something that people recognize, and that I want people. Um, I want people to love things, not just because it's a brand new thing they've never seen before, but because we take something that they are familiar with, that it does have meaning to them, and we put our own spin on it. We did our own version of it. Um, and Eldraine did that really well. Um, the other thing Eldraine did that really taught me was um, the modularness of how design can work and the idea that part of resonance isn't just thing A is resonant, is thing A and thing B can come together. And a lot of the fun of Eldraine is not that you're, I mean, you can recreate. You can take all the Cinderella pieces and put them together and make a Cinderella deck. You can do that. People have. Um, but it's also kind of fun that when I take something that I know from Cinderella and something I know from Pinocchio and I put them together, that somehow, you know, the, the little wooden boy is riding the magical carriage. That there's something, Eldraine really made me realize that not only is resonance fun, from its singular, this card is resonant in a vacuum, but that mixing and matching known resonant things is really enjoyable. That one of the great, one of the great things that magic does is the modularity of how it lets you take things that aren't connected and connect them. And that Eldrin really cemented to me how much fun that you taking resonance and mixing and matching resonance is itself very fun. And obviously magic did that in a big picture. Like you could take, you know, Innistrad, and Amin can put them together. Um, but the idea that a set could do that within the set is something really that Eldrain taught me that I thought was really important. Especially um, Eldrain. I love how there's Hans Christian Andersen and you have Arthurian tales and grim fairy tales. And yeah, they are all mushed together and it's cohesive. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, 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 the, the thing that's really fun for me when I look at Eldrain is how it, it took something. Like one of the reasons that people were so resistant to Eldrain is this idea that it was sort of too soft, if you will. You know, like, then when you, th you think of um, fairy tales, you think of, like, Disney films. And that, that I think that reads to people very young. You know, like, you know, who likes, you know, Disney films? And I think, like, oh, that's a young kid thing. Uh, a, adults love Disney films. But, um, but one of the things I had to say is, look, let's go to the source material. Let's go look at Grimm's fairy tales. Uh, look, it can get dark. The, the source material can get really, really dark. And so... Um, I said, part of the fun is, look, we get to figure out what our spin on it is. We get, like, I love that our, you know, Goldilocks hunts bears. You know, that, that's kind of fun. And that, you know, it's it's our spin. Like, okay, you know, she did meet the three bears. It just didn't end like it did. And maybe the, the version of the story that you know. Um, and that that part is, is, that is very fun to have. Another set I'm really excited for is Onfinity. Uh so I somehow managed to talk Aaron Forsyth into letting me lead the exploratory design, the vision design, the set design. Uh, and I'd never, I'd, never a, I'd never run a set design before. Um, now, I, I had a lot of play designers helping me. I, I had people to making sure that the, the areas of my weakness, I had that strength on my team to make sure that I, I was there. But uh, Unfinity is the first set that, like, from the, the inkling of making it to literally finalizing what goes on the cards was something that I was responsible for. And um, I am so proud of the set. And that is probably the most me set 
that you will see because I mean, and I had a lot of other people working with me. Chris Mooney was with me the entire way through. There, I, have a, I had a very dedicated and talented team uh, at, at many levels, uh, all working with me. Uh, this was not a solo project by any stretch of imagination, um, but it is the set that has the biggest thumbprint of me on it. Uh, and so I, I'm excited for people to see it because it is, it is, it's an unset, but it is is something a, a little bit different and, and really cool. Ma'am, that, that's some really good, great stories, by the way. Thank you very much for sharing, oh, no with, sharing that. And I know a lot of those are some of people's all-time favorite sets. I know Tempest is a, is a, uh, is a big one for me. That was one yeah. of the first major pre-release tournaments I ever went to back in Las Vegas. So yeah. uh, actually, I think it was my second. I think Mirage may have been my first. So I, okay. I believe that was my second. Um, but it, it's just nice to hear how even after all these years, some of these sets still yeah. just just hold on to you. I mean, like I said, well, I mean, like I said it's hard to pick. I mean, I, I've worked on so many sets and, you know, like the, every set is something that I really, like, I was really a fan of. I mean, there's only, I only have a handful of sets that I really regret. Like, I, ah, you know, maybe we'll do a podcast of my top 10 worst sets. <laughs> well, we, we all have to have a homeland somewhere, right? Yeah, I have, uh, I'm not real proud of Battle for Zendikar. Unhinged has lots of problems. I don't know. There, there's, there's some sets I made that uh, even Tide could have been better. Anyway, there, there's some, there's some sets I've made that have room for improvement. Well, for a future drive to work, for people who follow Mark Rosewater's podcast there on uh, whatever podcast service you listen to, drive to work on. And Mark, thank you again for uh, for joining me and, and talking about some of your, your favorite and most important magic sets. 